so I'm very happy to have uh, Jürgen here today. He's going to talk about multi-level semantic labeling of numerical values, which was one of his as his week submissions this year. Excellent. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, so welcome everybody. Um, yeah, I can probably skip over over this slide. Uh, that's just something about myself. So I was working or uh, doing a PhD in Dewey, and uh, I was working on I don't know Swissy. Maybe somebody still knows that system. Uh, I was already so long ago. <laughs> it was one of the first semantic web search engine. Uh, we worked on this dynamic link data observatory, which is still running, uh, still collecting data and, and other stuff. I, in the meanwhile, I was working for a company, for Shih Tzu, and uh, there they wanted to exploit the potential of link data. Uh, but it was just for one year, and then yeah, I had the options to go to Vienna, where I'm currently holding a postdoc there, and uh, now the, the topics kind of switched or shifted from, from querying more to data, data quality, and uh, data dynamics, or so evolution and freshness. Um, yeah, I also asked my colleagues what I should tell about our group, and uh, one thing I should always mention is the beautiful campus we have, and everybody should come and visit. Yeah, it's, um, so there was actually a competition for architects, and we have five buildings, and each building is designed by one particular architect. So our building is by Japanese, we have the learning center, which looks like the starship. Um, yeah, so it's uh, actually a really nice new campus. I think it's only two years old now. Uh, it's actually worth a visit, and everybody thinks it's great. It doesn't even come out. Okay, so. Just a quick idea what we do in the group, so maybe there are some, some interesting topics for you. One thing is uh, where I'm working actively on is something called the Open Data Portal Watch. It's a yeah, scalable quality assessment and monitoring framework for open data portals. So as I said, we, we do a lot of work in open data and at the moment one of the main publishing platforms for, for these kind of data sets are these portals which are catalogs where people can add metadata to describe what the data is about, and we look at uh, different quality dimensions. Um, another work, it's a project, and it was one of the reasons why I'm in, in Switzerland. The yesterday was this Open Data CH event, where we presented a project, and the project is called Adequate, um, which is about improving the quality of data. So, yeah, you see there's a lot of go going on. Um, we will look at algorithms to automatically improve data, uh, one option is like linking CSV files, uh, yeah, data linkages mentioned, but also we want to look in crowdsourcing techniques to allow people to improve the data. And uh, yeah, we do this together with the uh, two uh, use case partners from Austria, like the two open data portals in Austria. Another project which recently started is called GraphSense. Um, this is all about insights into digital currencies and exploration and pattern detection in this Bitcoin network. So, um, yeah, the other main idea is people want to know what's going on in this Bitcoin network. They want to have easy access to explore the graph. So this could be in a manual way, but also to find patterns over time and see what is a normal pattern and what could be not normal. Another project, I'm not sure, maybe it's more known here, is HDT. It's a, a colleague of mine. It's about a binary format for RDF, um, where yeah, he's working now on querying and, and evolution. Um, another project is the DBpedia Wayback Machine, uh, which just pretty much allows you to get different revision versions of Wikipedia in RDF. So you could ask, I don't know, you take the Vienna page and you say, like, give me the revision from two years ago and we convert it with a framework and it's pretty much just a, uh, a service. But you can travel back in time and, and actually collect a data set where you have evolving information or even missing information. Yeah, another project or another big thing we are digging into is uh, archiving and querying over archives. So you want to archive different versions of RDF and then, for example, ask queries like, give me the current address of my co-authors in 2014. Or what is the difference in temperature in Vienna between two dates? And uh, so far, there's not much, much work. Uh, we recently got now a paper accepted where we defined a blueprint for a benchmark so that we can 
benchmark the systems, but yeah, if somebody's interested in this, it's also something we do. And yeah, one thing from a colleague from Sabrina Kieran, she's looking into policies and access control in, in data, in RDF archives. Um, yeah, so we do also other stuff. Axel is still working on Sparkle, Sparkle 1.1 updates and freshness, but uh, I don't have any slides for this, so. Okay, let's come to today's talk. Um, it's about multi-label semantic labeling of numerical values. Um, yeah, what does it mean? So one of the motivation was open data. That's something which is in Vienna quite uh, a big topic because the city of Vienna puts a lot of effort in. And also when you look over the trend in the world, you see that more and more governments and, and countries jump on this wagon and call themselves, we have open data and we publish it. Also another slide uh, or infographics I found is the number of APIs. It stops here at 2011, but you could imagine this goes further. So there's actually a lot of data now available and more and more data gets out. This is uh, the value. These are like enterprises which use open data, at least the ones who, who registered on the service. And yeah, you see it's pretty much all over the world where people now start to use open data or produce open data as a company. So why is this especially interesting for us? Um, it's useful data. Why is it useful? Here's just a catalog, the domains of uh, the European data portal, where you see what kind of information you find. You find about organizations, about the law, politics, a lot of geographical information which is freely available, environmental, energy, healthcare. And uh, a lot of these sources are actually manually curated. So there's somebody behind who generates the data manually and then converts it to, for example, CSV or extracts it from a database. So the, the data is covering a lot of domains. Um, it's kind of authoritative because it comes from departments in the, in the state. And most of them are already manually put together or semi-manually. Um, yeah, what we want to do is we want to exploit this. We want to use this data. And there's the, the famous link data mark. <laughs> but uh, so we want to use it and we want to make sense out of it. So what do we do for this normally? We, coming from the semantic web, research area, you, you look immediately into linking data and using identifiers. And uh, that's one thing we want to do. And we want to focus on CSVs because it's one of the main, main formats out there. And ideally, we want to convert CSV files into an, or link them to knowledge graphs. And I wrote here partially because I believe this is not possible in general. There are definitely cases where we can only get some information out of the CSV files, but we cannot really translate the whole CSV file into a knowledge graph. Uh, yeah, the benefits, I think, are uh, well known here. What can you do? You have a better search and discovery for the data, obviously. It's easier to integrate if you have identifiers, which you can then map. And for the processing, it's also easier if you, if you know more about the information. So one example, what, uh, what is, yeah, pretty much widely done is like here's a, a table. It's just the capacity of football stadiums in, in Austria for the cities. And ideally you want to map them and you want to say like the first column talks about stadiums, instances or entities of, of type stadium. The second one describes the capacity. Uh, yeah, the third is the city and the next is the country. And then what you do is if you have these types and entities, you try to build a model which allows to, to say, like, for example, here, this would be the entity, and these are just attributes. The other option could be, this is an entity, and uh, Vienna has the attribute being in the country. So there are different ways. Yeah, what are existing approaches doing for this? Um, they do this labeling, where you normally use the header labels to map it to, to classes and properties, and you use the cell to get entities out of it. And then you do some kind of ontology alignment or mapping to figure out what is the, the model behind these, these types. All of these approaches, or most of them, actually focus on web tables because they are easy to parse. You have a lot of uh, syntax already in the HTML structure which tells you what is the header, what is the cell, is there a column, multi-column. Uh, you have maybe some classes which already give you uh, class text which gives you ideas um, and other things. And also, Web tables are made primarily for humans. 
So people are consuming web tables and or web pages, and then you want to have labels which a human can can identify. These are normally labels you also find in dictionaries, you find on Wikipedia, DBpedia, so the linking is much easier. And yeah, they are focusing mainly on textual descriptions of these mappings. So now when we look at open data in the CSV files, um, we find that a large portion of these columns in a table are numerical. And we have missing headers, or the headers are non-textual. So it could be some alphabetic uh, IDs. Um, yeah. So what we did to, to verify this assumption, we just looked at some tables as an initial study. And for example, in the Austrian portal, half of the columns are numbers, so numerical. So you cannot do entity matching to get an idea of what it's talking about. Um, yeah, like, uh, what is it, an eighth has no headers, so you don't even know what the column is about. Um, numerical headings, yeah. So we try to, to map the headers we have. So like from these 6,400 numerical columns with a header, we try to map the, the header values to Babelnet or with Babelnet to get some idea if we can get a, a concept information or an entity information, and only roughly 20% returned results. So for 80% of the headers, we couldn't, at least with Babelnet, not get any results. For the European poll, it, it looks roughly similar, yeah. So labeling and uh, converting tabular CSV data uh, needs more approaches than only relying on textual uh, clues. Yeah, so what we want to do is actually we would like to, to take this back of numerical values, and we would like to know that this is very likely the capacity uh, of a stadium, maybe in the country of Austria. But we don't have headers, or it's very likely we don't have headers. And uh, maybe the surrounding is also numerical, is pretty much always not available. And now we have this case that we, the isolated case, which we address in this paper is, yeah, you have a bag of numbers and you want to know what could be a semantic description for it. I think other use cases would be streaming data, where you get a stream of numbers from a sensor, and you would like to know if this is from an indoor temperature sensor or a humidity sensor, or maybe you have two streams and you know they kind of belong together. So we have, there are some use cases from, from Siemens. Okay, so how we, we address this problem was in, like, in three steps. So the first one, we apply some hierarchical clustering over an RDF knowledge base to derive a hierarchy of nodes where nodes are representing numerical values. And we annotate these nodes, for example, with the property where we got the numbers from, uh, of the types of the entities, and contextual pairs. So once we, we have this hierarchy in the nodes, we kind of uh, apply some k nearest neighbor search for, our, for a given set of numbers to find what are the most closest uh, numerical representations. And then we can do some aggregation over the results at different levels um, to figure out what is the most likely interpretation of these numbers. So for example, what is the most likely property, where these numbers came from, maybe we get the type and the context. So here's one example what we what we have in the paper, how it could look. So we have these background knowledge graphs where each node represents a set of, of numbers and some annotations of the entities. And then we have a type hierarchy where we just pretty model that, uh, I don't know, T3 is a subtype of, uh, of V, or T1 is a subtype of, of V. And we have this PO hierarchy where each node represents entities, or the numbers of, of entities for a property which share the same PO uh, pairs. I will probably get clearer in, in a bit on the slides. Uh, yeah, so once you have then an input value, you map the distance, you get some results back, and you can do some aggregation. Uh, to get like an idea of what is the most likely type. Good. So let's start with the first step. How do we generate this background knowledge? The first one for this type hierarchy, we pretty much uh, go into the knowledge base. We extract properties which have a numerical domain or numerical range. Yeah. And uh, then we collect all the entities for these properties or for these values, uh, extract all their PO pairs and the types, materialize the old class hierarchy, and then we form this type hierarchy. So like here's an example. We have the property dbpedia height, where you have a set of values, and then we figured out that there's a subcluster 
where the entities belong to the type person. Another cluster is uh, the values which belongs to entities of type building. And for person, you have, for example, basketball players as a sub type. Another example for capacity, we have sports facilities, aircrafts. Under sports facilities, you have a, a specific type stadium. Good. So yeah, each cluster pretty much contains then the num numerical values of the entities for the property capacity, which are of type, for example, stadium. So the next step is this PO hierarchy, and there we do this divisive hierarchical clustering, which is pretty much a top-down approach where you start with one node. Uh, you select some candidate nodes. Um, once you select the candidate node, you pretty much iter or recursively apply the algorithm and, and go down. So in each sub-node, I mean, we have a restriction that there are these two nodes are, are distinct from the set of entities. And uh, we further pose some constraints. I mean, obviously, all nodes in one or all entities in one candidate node should sa share the same property object pair. And they should have a certain size. And this is a, a parameter you can tune. But the idea is you don't want to have two specific nodes, but you don't want to have two broad ones. Um, yeah, then afterwards, we sort the candidates by a distance function. That's, uh, there are different ways to do these distance functions, which I explained. But the idea is like you want to select the node which is the furthest away from its parent node, so that you have the most descriptive or separate values. And then you just select the other nodes from there. Good. So what we do afterwards in, yeah, like a, uh, as an example, we, we take all the nodes and we represent them as points more or less in a vector space. And here's, as an example, a two-dimensional vector. And for example, the dimensions could be the minimum and the maximum of the values. So yeah, we map them into the space. We do this pretty much for all property. And then you have here a number of spaces. Um, afterwards, we compute and, and rank the k-nearest neighbors. So there the idea is you have a set of input values. Uh, again, you map them to your vector space. Then you compute the distance to all to the k nearest neighbors or to the k neighbors. Um, and you select the, the k nearest. So like, for example, here the first six. Um, yeah, in the next step, we want to rank them. And uh, so you can use different algorithms for this. So one is majority vote. So you just count like, OK, from these six neighbors, how many are of, of the type white? So this would be then three. So you say, like, yeah, three out of six nodes are of type white, and yeah, two out of six yellow. And then you can say, uh, if you, for example, do it on property, you say, like, OK, these three nodes belong to capacity. I think that was here the idea when we look at the mapping. So the white nodes represent nodes in the, uh, in the height um, property graph. And uh, so this would be your first guess. You say, like, oh, they, these values are maybe presenting height. And you could then further, if you for example, go to type, you see that these three nodes are under basketball player. So you would assume it's the height of a basketball player. And then if you want to go further, you could even figure out and say, for example, it's maybe in the National Basketball League. So you have this step different levels. And based on the aggregation, you can uh, yeah, play around. OK, so that's the approach. It's actually quite, quite simple, but uh, it works pretty well, as you will see. So what we <coughs> did for an evaluation, we used dbpedia. We selected the most 50 most frequent numerical properties. We extracted or we excluded some like the revision ID property, uh, so like properties which are just counts or internal IDs. And here's just the distribution of uh, the min max range of these properties. So and you see like they are kind of uh, nicely distributed. I think these ones belong to, to the year. So there are somehow properties like first year, birth year, death year. Um, yeah, and others are capacity, height, um, uh, these things. So as a distance functions, we applied once the Euclidean distance over, for example, min, max, mean, standard deviation. And the other one, which was used by Heiko Paulheim once in a paper for outlier detection, was a distribution similarity, where you use this kolmogorov smirnov distance functions of, of two distribution. And you get a value of 1 if they are pretty much the same distributions, and null if they are not overlapping. 
Um, yeah, our aggregation functions, we played around with a majority vote and an average distance vote. So it just means like you take, for example, for all property height, the, the distances, and you build the average and, and rank your results based on this. Um, yeah, we used 30 gigabyte RAM as a server. That was fine. And we played around at the beginning with three different knowledge-based constructions. So one was, so where we tried different distance functions. Um, yeah, you see prediction time for a set of numerical values is 2.5 seconds, which is actually slow. But uh, it was also not our, our purpose to optimize the system yet, and we didn't apply any of these <laughs> k-nearest search um, optimizations. What we did for, for the testing, so we, we have our data set and we split it in 80-20 uh, parts. Um, that means like we took 20% of the subjects for each property and we extracted them as a test data set <coughs> and the remaining 80 we used to build our background knowledge base. Um, from the 20% of the subjects for the test data, we built also uh, background knowledge, but without the constraints. So we just selected all possible candidates and, and we worked down. So this allows us, if we select a leaf node, that it's uh, very likely that this leaf node is not represented in the background knowledge. Otherwise, it would be probably very biased, the, the evaluation. Yeah, coming to the, to the distance function tests, um, these are the accuracy. That means like for a given node, we looked at different levels. So for example, property accuracy would just mean for this node, we got the right property, for example, in the top one results using uh, this min, mean, max distance, or in the top five, or in the, in the top ten. Uh, for type, it's like we got the right type in, from this type hierarchy. S type was uh, the correct super type. So if we say, like, we have here a node which is a stadium, um, or what was it, uh, like, which is a, a person, and uh, we selected a node which is a basketball player, then we co consider this as a correct match. And the exact would be we have the right property type uh, and PO pair. And um, yeah, so this was a small test, but uh, it was already pretty clear that this Euclidean distance wasn't really working well. And uh, yeah, using distribution distance similarity um, worked quite good. So that was just to select which knowledge base makes sense and which construction makes sense. So then we, we applied this large scale test where we tested then with around 33,000 nodes, um, of which only 9% had a one-to-one -one mapping from the test data to the background knowledge we used. So it means like 9% of the nodes had the exact property, type, and PO pair as represented in the background knowledge. That means the other 91% uh, of the nodes were only partially represented in, in the background. So this kind of hopefully reflects a more realistic use case where you don't know all the, you don't have all the information in your background knowledge. Uh, we tested two aggregation functions. One was this majority and the other one was the average vote. And we played around with different case for the neighbor. So here we considered the 25 closest neighbors and here the 20, uh, the 50 closest. And then based on the aggregation, we took the top one, five or 10 results. So when you look at the properties, so just getting the right property for the numerical value, we achieved with the 50 neighbors and the top 10 values already 99%, which was actually quite surprising. Um, but uh, pretty cool <laughs> to get this result. And even with the top five, you are around 89%, which is just a good indication that in the top 5% of the properties, you have the right one. Uh, for the right type, yeah, we, we achieved the best result around uh, 96%. Uh, yeah, by all types, it was also 96, yeah. The PO level, that's actually getting the right context there. Uh, this seems quite tricky, and we have to probably refine a little bit the generation. We only reached 80% roughly of it. But it would still mean like in 80% of the cases, we got right that this is a basketball player in the national NBA and the height of a national, or of a basketball player in the national hockey league, uh, basketball league. What you also see is like, obviously, if you take more neighbors, the results get better. It's like you just have more evidences that it's closer to, to this part, but um, yeah. And the majority vote function seems to be slightly better than using the average distance. Um, 
So based on these results, we thought like, cool, we, we tested it on DBpedia. It seems like really good. Let's go out and, and play around with the CSV tables and see how good we, we can label it. So we used these uh, roughly 1,700 1, tables. Uh, we tried to label all numerical columns and then we inspected manually the top 100 tables and we just selected them by the distance of the, the highest uh, result and then minimized it. So we said, like, give me all the tables where our tool thinks we are the closest to our knowledge base. So in other terms, where we think like we have the, the most accurate or the highest certainty that the prediction is right. Um, yeah, we played around and it was kind of uh, devastating results because we looked at it and, and it didn't really make sense. And then we started to look into it and we figured out a lot of the CSV files, they have um, timeline data. So that means like they have the result for 2014, 15, 16, 13, 12. This is information which is not in DBpedia. In DBpedia, we have the latest snapshot, like the average temperature in 2014. In the CSV table, we have the average temperature from 2013 to somewhere else. Um, we had a lot of missing domain knowledge. So in, we found a lot of CSV tables which report demographics. Like this was the number of BMW sold in Vienna in 2014. And this was the numbers of uh, Mercedes sold. And surprisingly, we labeled most of these values as uh, population, <laughs> which it's, yeah, it's actually wrong from the label, but when you look at it, it's kind of a population statistic that when you have the demographics, like how many male between zero and 20 you have, or how many female, or, or how many older people, also like the different age ranges, and you have the counts per district. But yeah, we, we also, yeah, we missed a lot of knowledge. Like we didn't have information about spendings, about election results in DBpedia. There was not much about tourism um, and, and other domains, yeah. So that means just we have to ex extend the knowledge base. Um, one thing which uh, occurred to us there, and that probably ties back to, to what you guys are doing, is aggregating of column scores. So if you, if you are bad for one column, uh, maybe if you take the neighbor columns and the labels of it and you look at what they have in common, gives you much more evidence and signals to predict that actually the table talks about uh, demographic values or about people. And I mean, obviously we, we address the problem in a very isolated case. We just say like, give me numerical values. and. <laughs> there are many, many approaches where you use this textual knowledge, which is in the tables as well. So there was something, we, since we didn't combine it with uh, other approaches, I mean, this was kind of limit as well. Um, but in general, the findings was like, it's not straightforward to label numerical values in CSVs, and uh, we have to do much more. We have to extend the knowledge base. We have to work more on extracting the values or understanding the values if they are, sometimes we had aggregates, you have like normal values and then the, the total sum, which is, uh, or the average, which makes it even harder. Good, that would be already the part. So conclusion is like what we did, semantic labeling with numerical values by applying this K nearest neighbor search, which performed very well uh, on the knowledge base, which was built in this hierarchical unsupervised way. Um, the nice part is we can assign these fine-grained semantic labels if we have enough evidence in the knowledge base. Um, but we are already quite good in just getting the right property, at least with the DBpedia data, and the, I mean, for the parent types or for the entity types as well. For these PO pairs, we have 80%, which uh, probably could be tuned, hopefully, further. Um, yeah, future work, I think I just mentioned it for the CSV tables, is that something we want to look into and we want to look into more knowledge bases, like Wikidata seems very promising. Uh, maybe even knowledge from CSV files, like from Eurostats, which we can understand and manually label and, and extract it. Um, yeah, that would be from my side. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs>